Welcome, everybody. Now, tonight, we want to find out from you, Jeremiah, on this incredible subject. Uh, how do we fight fair? Uh, do we put boxing gloves on uh, and then say, have a good, good one? How do the kids really work this whole thing out? So will you take us on this journey? Take a, a little time and explain to us how you see things. You've got five of your own kids. Uh, and uh, how do you deal with all of that? Go you ahead. Bet. You bet. All right. Well, let's get started then. Thank you so much, Paulus. Well, welcome everyone tonight. We're going to be talking about how to fight fair. And the theme, of course, with that on the side is family feud, how to fight fair. And of course, that's you know, challenging. I, I like what uh, Paulus was saying there. Do we put the boxing gloves on or do we do old fashioned, good old street fighting there? You know, go old school. Well, either way, they can both hurt. They can both create its own unique challenges. And, uh, you know, of course, this is a topic that whether you may or may not be aware of is a huge topic. Okay. So really what I'm doing tonight is just kind of introducing a concept some themes within that that might lead to some other questions that maybe i'm not going to get a chance to talk about tonight but definitely we can expand on during the question answer period and uh, along with those uh, questions from there we can then maybe look at some other ways but it's definitely the beginning okay and it's interesting when i started even planning this I ended up with what I realized could probably easily be an hour, two hour presentation. So I had to chop, chop, chop it all down into just a nice little friendly conversation for tonight, just to at least introduce this concept. So depending on the popularity and interest further in this, it might lead to a part two, who knows, you know, or I guess in the boxing case, we'll call it round two next time, you know. But that being said, I'm just going to open up my screen share here and we'll kind of get started. Just have a small little PowerPoint. Um, really, it just helps me to stay focused and uh, we'll go from there. So Family Feud is a show I grew up with watching. I mean, Paula said it, so it's no secret. Uh, you know, this show has been around yeah, probably at least 50 years, if not 45 years at least, okay? It's a show that was on in the States. You'd have two sets of families, groups of five that would get together. They'd answer questions, and whoever got the questions that were closest to the answers from what other people were given based on surveys, um, whatever the survey said, whoever got the most, would win yay and they'd win whatever the prize money was for the day or the prize and stuff like that and this show has gone on i think they're on like their third or fourth host uh so this show has been going on forever and i believe it is still going on um so it's just kind of a fun little thing here so i had a little bit of fun family feud live how to fight fair so just a few little for fun copyright infringement. <clears throat> I mean, a uh, little bit of fun logoing here that I had with the uh, screen title. But uh, beyond that, we want to talk about what I call the rules of the game. When we're talking about a family feud, and who knows, you don't need just two families to have a feud, okay? You can just have it within your own family unit, okay? But to win this game, okay? you must know the rules of the game. So that's kind of the premise we're going with tonight. So to start off with, what are some of the rules of the game? Number one, we want to beware of adrenaline, okay? You see what happens is when we start getting in conflict, when we have a disagreement, when we have something that maybe I have a motive of something I want, maybe someone else has a motive of something they want, all of a sudden, this little thing in the back of us, behind our back on the left-hand side, all right, above the uh, kidney is this little butterfly-shaped thing called the adrenal gland that's spitting up chemicals like adrenaline that's shooting throughout our body but also shoots within our head, okay? And that specifically, one of those areas connects to a different part of our body called the amygdala. This is a picture of our brain. Now, 
I was thinking of superimposing a picture here, but it didn't quite happen. So we're just going to go with a nice boring picture. But uh, this is whoever this person is in this little centered part. All right. This is a side view. If you were looking at me directly, if I were to take my fingers, put it between my ears and touch just behind the nose eye line area is this little tiny dot thing called the amygdala. All right. And that's one of the areas that that adrenaline the chemical part that's shooting in our body is touching. And this is where we get what is called oftentimes a fight or flight response within ourselves chemically within our body. So in other words, when somebody uh, gets in a conflict, one or both, someone's going to end up in either a fight mode, put on the gloves or without, or they're going to be in a flight. I got to get out of here. I'm not safe. I'm not dealing with this. Now, oftentimes, if someone's kind of stuck in the middle, they have another term that we'll, we'll talk about sometimes, and that's called freeze, which is a term uh, done with studies on animals, you know, or even people. This, this is the concept where if a bear was suddenly to attack you, play dead, because that's the freeze factor. I can't run. I can't fight the bear. I'm going to freeze. I'm going to play dead. And maybe he'll kind of play around with me a little bit. And then I will, he can move on. And then I can kind of slowly uh, go get to the hospital to uh, hopefully feel a little better. So that's where the freeze comes into play. Uh, I don't know what to say. Uh, 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 okay. And so that freeze could be either I'm about to lose my nut. And if I don't freeze, I'm going to create damage and that's going to be bad. Or I need to run and get out of here, but I can't get out of here. And that's where I'm going to freeze. So just a little bit of understanding chemically what's happening within us. But this leads into a kind of an interesting intro topic to the concept of family feuding. Okay, when we're talking about family feud and how to fight fair, because you see every good feud begins with key players. Okay, so let's take a look at some of these key players could be the traditional husband and wife matchup, okay? Maybe it's the mom with their child or the teenage child, okay? Maybe get some feuding happening there. Maybe it's dad and the child or teen. Maybe it's the child to child or what we call sibling rivalry. Or put it all together and together we get a family feud and the whole family is maybe talking a little more louder, maybe a little more aggressively, maybe crying, maybe running away, not wanting to deal with things. What is that about? How do we then fight fair? So in order to do that, let's introduce tonight, I'm going to introduce two teams in this game called Family Feud and How to Fight Fair. First one is what I call Team Pursuer. We're going to talk about that in just a second. Who is the pursuer? Then the other team is team runner. So we've got team pursuer and we've got team runner. So with that, let's talk about what, what do you mean team pursuer, Jeremiah? Let's talk about what a pursuer is. Okay. So a pursuer is someone who kind of maybe a little bit exaggerated but maybe not. This is a person who's got 10 to 20 things that need to be dealt with. Okay. I've got this. We've got, we've got to talk about bills. We've got to talk about the kids. We've got to talk about uh, maybe some COVID. We got to talk about, do we do this? All the, all these life things that are in the way and we got to deal with it now. Okay. The pursuer might also be someone who oftentimes tends to be very, they think fast, they're quick witted, okay, just always, always spinning their brain. I lie down in bed, brrr, I got all these different ideas and I got to think, okay, as a generality. This is the person who needs resolve now, not yesterday, not tomorrow, now. We're dealing with this and we're dealing with this now. The other person is the runner. OK, now, of course, we can have a little bit of combos, but oftentimes as a generality, 
I find you'll find in a feud situation, you'll find a pursuer and a runner. So what's a runner? The runner is a person who can only deal with one or two things that need to be dealt with immediately, or they feel extremely, very overwhelmed. Too much information running through my brain. Too much information, it is driving me insane. All right. Now, oftentimes, the runner tends to be slower in thought. Now, that does not mean that they are stupid or less intelligent than their pursuer. It just means how they are thinking can be a little bit different. They're slower quite often in making quick decisions. They're very methodical in their approach and how they think and how they work through things. Okay. Another word along with methodical could be analytical in their ways. Okay. Got to think things through. Take it easy. Take it slow. This is the person who goes, I need this resolved later. Much later, please and thank you. It's all good. We'll deal with this later. You know what? Let's sleep on it. We'll deal with it maybe tomorrow, maybe next week. We'll, we'll get around. We're going to get around to it. We're going to deal with it. Don't worry about it. It'll all come together. It's all going to be good. So the pursuer versus the runner. And if we can start recognizing that within our family units, as I like to say, that's literally half the battle and half of how to learn how to fight fair. Let's continue on. Now, in order to start recognizing how to fight fair, we got to set up some ground rules. So if, as I'm talking about this, you're recognizing, oh my gosh, I'm a pursuer, or maybe you're going, maybe you're nudging your partner beside you and you're going, oh yeah, that's you. Uh, you are such a pursuer. Got to deal with this now. Well, one thing pursuers can do to help them in recognizing that is to, first of all, back off and allow space, okay? Back off and allow space, okay? Remember, the uh, runner tends to feel very overwhelmed with too much information, so we got to back off and allow space. The second thing that can be done is pursuers, if you're a pursuer, I would encourage you to consider picking no more than one or two of the most important things that need to be discussed. It's not that there aren't 10 or 20 different things that do need to be dealt with now, but chances are they're not going anywhere. Chances are they can be dealt with tomorrow, but can we deal with the most important things that do absolutely must be done with now? And let's pick those one or two things to deal with that. Now, can't just pick on all the pursuers, of course. We also need to discuss setting some ground rules with runners. If you are recognizing, I am a runner. Oh my gosh, I don't want to deal with this right now. I want to deal with this later. Well, number one, runners, consider healthily isolating and process your thoughts and decisions needing to be made. See, part of the problem with running is that oftentimes it's an unhealthy form of processing or coping, all right? So you end off, I said, I'm out of here, I'm going for a drive, and you drive, and two days later, you show back at home. Might not be good unless it's an agreed-upon ground rule. And so we want to figure out how long. Think of adrenaline, going back to that concept I talked about. Whether you're a pursuer or a runner, that adrenaline on average for the average person can be between 5 to 15 minutes long before that adrenaline that spiked up comes down. And then all of a sudden, all right, let's deal with this. And you know that if you've ever been an individual who has maybe had a bit of a fight and finally when everything settles down, you kind of come back and 10 minutes later, oh, I'm so tired. Oh, I'm so exhausted. That means chances are adrenaline was working in your system. And a side outcome after effect of adrenaline is that the body gets tired and weary after it has hit its spike, it comes down, and you're tired. So runners healthily isolate, okay, and process those thoughts and decisions need to be made. We'll talk more about that in just a moment. Secondly, 
runners, if you're recognizing you're a runner, after processing, you must come back to your partner or family members and deal with the issues, okay? Deal with the issues after processing. This leads us, I, I initially introduced, you know, team pursuer, team runner. But what I'd like to do now that we have a little bit more of some winning strategies, now that we maybe recognize where you're at and what, how you might deal with conflict, I'd like to suggest a new set of teams, all right? Changing the team logo, changing the team name. And the first one is the team presenter now. This is what I would suggest is the healthy way to consider how to fight fair. One of you, if you're a pursuer, is consider changing your pursuing to being a presenter versus if you're a runner, stop running and now be part of team processor. You're not running, you're just processing. You just need some time to deal with it and then you're gonna come back and deal with it now that you've had a chance to process it, however you process. So for the presenter, know your audience. Okay, the presenter knowing your audience, kind of like marketing in some regards. If, I, if I'm selling something, if I'm pitching something to you, hey, I got this great idea. If you give that person too many things, they're going to get overwhelmed. They're going to be like, wow, that's awesome. Good idea. Bye-bye. And we don't want that. Know your audience, especially if you know your audience or other person you're in conflict with. If they happen to be a, a runner, or what eventually will be a processor, then know your audience. Give them that one or two things only. Again, pick no more than one or two of the most important things that need to be presented. Once the discussion is complete, all right, I'll add here, give space, all right? Let them process. And then once that conversation is done, then you can move on to the next presentation. You will lose the family feud if you present too much and overwhelm the processor. So the processor, okay, needs to process and discuss, okay? Process the presentation given by the presenter given, and here's the key for one of the ground rules and how to fight fair for the agreed amount of time. And then you must come back to discuss. Now, I don't know if you're a processor, what that time's gonna be. Some people need processing time. They need 10 minutes to think about something. Some people, they need a solid hour. Whoa, this is a heavy thing, okay. So we're dealing with this conflict. We're dealing with this situation. I'm going to have to think about it. But I'm now doing it in a intentionally healthy, isolated way, not an unhealthy, isolated way, but a healthy, isolated way. So maybe I do need to go to my room, take some time, maybe pray, maybe read a book, maybe call a friend, call a helpline. Maybe I need to go for a walk. Maybe I need to go for a drive and just calm down, let some of that adrenaline go and come back, whatever that agreed upon time is. Maybe it's 20 minutes, maybe it's an hour. That's to be discussed between you and your family members, whatever the situation is. So that way you are having something that you do have time to process, but you don't have that excuse anymore to run. Because remember runners, your pursuer or now the presenter is able to go, hey, I'm going to give you space, take all the time you want, or is an hour okay? Come back in an hour. Let's continue on with this discussion. Okay. Just a different way of looking at it. So ultimately, this leads us to that third winning strategy. Now, both the presenter and the processor can discuss and agree upon the rules of engagement. So how is space going to be given if you're, if you're a presenter? How much time does the processor need? Agree and discuss and talk about those rules of engagement so that way you know what's fair. 
a teenager might need some time to calm down because that part of the brain is over challenged, over stimulated. Maybe we got some emotion kicking in and they're going to need some time to work things through. Maybe they just need to talk it out if they're a presenter style. If they're if your child is a presenter, they just need to talk. And as a processor, you're just going to have to sit back and listen to them, allow their voice to be heard. Same thing with couples. OK, it works both ways that way. Just make sure, though, in whatever the situation, OK, that you are in those conversations as best as possible, emotionally, mentally and physically present or you will both lose the family feud. You know, being present is a very important concept. You know, this is quite often, you know, when you're dealing with, let's say, a family or a couple situation, you know, all of a sudden, honey, are you listening to me? Oh, yeah, 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 dear, I'm here. Well, okay, how many of you know you can be in the room, I can be on screen, but not really on screen? OK, I can be physically present, but maybe I'm not mentally present. Maybe I'm physically and mentally present, but am I emotionally in tune with how I'm feeling? Am I emotionally in tune with how my partner or my family is feeling? We got to combine all three of these together. And if that sounds like hard work, yeah, some days it is, depending where we're at. But that's OK. At least we know. And now we can take responsibility for our actions, whether we are a presenter or a processor, and be able to work with what we have and what God has given us as our personality types, as our, you know, as our presenter or our processor type or style, whatever we're doing. OK. Key is this as well. Another winning strategy, okay, is if neither team individually or as a family unit can resolve the issue and emotions are beginning to escalate or that adrenaline starting to go round two again, here it's rising up again. It's time for both sides to have a timeout, okay? It's okay. I mean, we do it with kids. We, we, you know, I mean, that's kind of a common thing, whether you're talking about timeouts or time ins, depending on what parenting style you follow. But I also encourage adults, hey, timeouts are not just for kids. They are for us as parents, because I need maybe five, 10 minutes to calm down. So I'm not freaking out and saying something or doing something that I regret later on. And now I'm having to go to counseling or my kids are having to go to counseling or all of us are having to go to counseling. You know, we all make our mistakes. All right. We all have our challenges that we work out. But by allowing us a time out, it allows us to be able to calm down so we can come back being calm, caring and more approachable. OK. And uh, so just something to keep in mind as well as a winning strategy where we're dealing with a family feud. Some final thoughts I just kind of wanted to wrap up with before we kind of open things up for questions and stuff is imagine if we all learned to practice how to fight fair. Right now, the group of us here, if we can start applying, start considering some of these principles, even though they're very basic beginning principles, imagine what, how our families could maybe start to function, to flow, to at least have some more hope within it. How might that make a difference in your family's and my family's life and personal well-being as well? Being able to go, oh, I made a mistake, but at least now I know where I made my, my mistake, how I made my mistake, and now I can make proper amends or apologize or forgiveness to where I made that mistake, and that is a good thing. OK, because now rather than it happening every single day for the next five, 10 years. Now, maybe I can start decreasing it to once in a while, to once a week, to once a month, to never to all of a sudden that family now being a healthy whole unit that, yeah, is going to have its feuds. 
but is being done fighting fairly with ground rules in place if space is needed, if timeouts are needed, if time is needed to process, or if there are maybe actually five, 10 things that need to be dealt with, can we spread it out a little bit? Okay. So that being said, I just wanted to open things up to see if there were any questions regarding what I've talked about or anything uh, family related that uh, regarding family feuding of sorts, whether it's couples or families, kids, whatever, more than welcome to bring those up. And that's where you get to put me on the hot seat and I get to bring up my creativity and see what comes out. So, so how do you, what are some of the ways or things um, that you can look out for to identify the different types that you have in your home in terms of um, the different categories you stated, like, uh, um, I, I don't know if I should call it attributes or differences on in, sure, in the sure. way we yeah. fight. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, great question. Um, observation is definitely going to help. Uh, the good news is uh, if they're an infant, you don't have to worry about that because they don't talk back. Um, however, as far as your partner goes, depending on how long you've been married, uh, I, I have been, uh, as Paulus was saying earlier, uh, I've been married for 21 years now. Uh, I know what uh, style when we are in something whether I'm in a pursuant mode or if I am maybe in a processing mode, okay? Uh, you know, or in this case, a presenter mode that I need to shift from pursuer to presenter or if I'm running and now need to actually go process, okay? Um, as far as kids as well, that's just part of that observation, asking questions, observing your kids, finding out their styles. Not always, but a general good rule of thumb. A lot of people are familiar with the terms introvert or extrovert. Uh, a lot of introverts do tend to be more on the processor side. A lot of extroverts, not always, but can be very much in that pursuant side. Certain temperaments will also. So if a person tends to be very forward in thought and how they speak and how they talk, they always have ideas. They're always like, hey, we need to deal with this now. That will definitely be a good clue as to whether an individual or not is in the area of um, being probably a pursuer. But if they're like, I don't want to deal with this. I can't deal with this. Oh, I don't want to do it. Chances are those are pretty good signs that there might be some, this might be a person who needs to learn how to healthily process. All right, and then come back and deal with that situation one or two things at a time. So that way they're not overwhelmed. Does that kind of answer your question? Definitely does. The husband and wife one, we can easily, it's the kids one I was interested in. So yeah, you did uh, yeah. nail it hand on. Thank you. Yeah, for sure. You are welcome. Yeah. And I, was, I will add, if you can recognize uh, your partner's style, you can also ask your kids. I, I mean, it's, it's, you know, it's one of those things, ask them, hey, do you think you're a person who likes to deal with it now? Or do you like to wait maybe a day or a week before you deal with something? There's some, some, some good hints or, you know, depending on how they answer or what they feel like, oh, I don't really want to answer that right now. Their processor. All right. Well, I think that we need to deal with stuff now. It drives me crazy with Oh, they're they're pursuing they're pursuing, and now they get to be redirected as the parent. You can help them to be a presenter now. Okay. Uh, I just have a question. Is it possible that someone um, can change, probably like a child, change from being like a um, a presenter to a processor, maybe after some years? Or it's like once you are a once you have a particular attribute, you're kind of cast into like that mm. attribute, and then it's like for your lifetime? Yeah, good question. I, I'm never one to pigeonhole someone. I, I remember back in my 20s, I remember taking um, some personality tests and stuff. And I was like one of the earlier ones that was way back in the 80s and 90s that was very popular amongst the church, for example, uh, was Tim LaHaye's material. Uh, and he kind of had these concepts. It was a four quadrant based 
personality question you'd have what's called like a sanguine personality they were like the party animals you'd have the you know choleric you know they're very attackative you'd have the uh what was the other ones phlegmatic there may be more of the quiet style and then there was a what was that fourth one mm -hmm. that was the melancholy was the other one the melancholy the moody the artist you know and i remember very clearly um I, I was very much a, I always tended to answer within the melancholy attributes of personality. Jump 10, 15 years later, okay, so now I'm in my 30s, 35 kind of area, and, and um, you know, I, I was completely in the choleric part, like clear choleric, and I was like, what is going on here? Hey, it's just differences, right? I'm sure if I were to take it now, I might even have something different. I'm at a point in my life, I probably, depending on what the topic is, am very much a uh, presenter. I have to learn to present because I pursue like a dog and a bone. And so sometimes I have to back off and give space. But there are other things I've recognized in my life. I don't want to deal with, I hate dealing with it. I don't like it. Uh, you deal with it, dear. And that's where I recognize I'm being a runner. Nope, I need to process it, set some ground rules, come back and deal with it, even though I don't want to. All right, so there will be elements where you'll see both, okay? Um, kind of like that introvert extrovert concept uh, is a good example. I am probably more introvert, I am, but a lot of people sometimes think, oh, he's an extrovert. No, no, I'm not sure, what is it? Well, I am more introvert but I've learned to jump over into the realm of extrovert. And that title in the last couple of years has been given the term ambivert. So I'm very much ambivert, but more on the spectrum of introvert. Now, a raging introvert, no, they're, they are pure processor for the most part, okay? Um, but again, temperament has everything too. You know, some people can be introverts, but be very much, this is how we're gonna do it. I got to do it. And those are where we enter then into different personality type tests um, of which probably one of the better ones that I've liked recently from a Christian perspective is Mark Gungor's flag page. Um, I know I was using the flag page. I would use that quite often with couples and have some fun, work things through, but it allows you to see those temperaments and those differences, but also then appreciate those differences and know where to approach and how to approach, especially when the feud happens. So I have a question here uh, that has been, uh, if your partner is normally a pursuer or presenter in most feuds, and then in a particular feud turns to a runner, is it a, an issue or something to be worried about in the feud? I would actually say that is an awesome lead in to probably what I generally go into next round two, which is understanding a concept called triangulation. You can go online. Uh, I even have some stuff on my website you can take a look at. Um, and it's called triangulation. A guy, it's uh, the guy's name is Cartman, but with a K. All right. So if you spell Cartman, you can phonetically spell it out. Uh, other names of it, it's called the drama triangle. And I'll tell you, if it's one thing we North Americans love is our drama. We love our drama, 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 drama. There's a reason why uh, reality TV has unfortunately, <clears throat> I mean, has gone on for over 20 years now. Um, it is, um, yeah. And so triangulation is a great next step in understanding the dynamics of where, yeah, we can go from pursuer to then all of a sudden, okay, I need to process this or vice versa. So it's not about, it's more about the area when you understand triangulation, we can all in milliseconds go to all these different areas. Okay. And uh, with that, if we are aware of what's happening, then we know how to deal with it. And if the partner needs the process, then if they were pursuing, well, then what are those ground rules going to be discussed? Can those ground rules be discussed? And when is that person who is in pursuant mode now in processing mode, when are they going to process and then come back? What is that agreed upon time between both you and your partner? So that way 
you guys aren't left hanging on eggshells. And yes, to clarify, you can have pursuer, pursuer, which means both need to then present, present. Or you can have runner, runner, well, you'll never get anything done, but it does mean then that you have to both process healthily and then come back and deal with it, okay? So all sorts of things. We don't want to just, um, you know, like I say it before, similar to a Kin's question, you know, we don't want to just pigeonhole, oh, you're that, you know, they're generalities, but they at least are beginning steps to help recognize where we are coming from and where maybe our partner or family members are coming from in order for us to be able to then look at healthy ways and how to fight fair. Um, so, yeah, I uh, thank you. I, I like that whole concept of um, identifying which part you're which part you, you fit in and, and laying the ground rules. So I think um, my understanding is when, when you're fighting with your spouse, I think it can be easier to do that because you're both adults. Do you have any tips for dealing with a child or specifically a teenager that doesn't seem to be willing to engage in any way, but just keeps running? Yeah, and that's, of course, welcome to the teenage years. Welcome to yet another session of family table talk for probably down the road. And uh, very good question. No easy answers, obviously, just with the time we have. But if they are a processor, then that's a good thing to at least recognize. Because now that discussion can go, hey, I'm just curious. I'm wondering if when mom or dad talks, is is there a sense of feeling overwhelmed or anxiety or what's happening? Just, you know, are you feeling overwhelmed? You know, and maybe part of that is also looking at the style of parenting that maybe you're doing. And within that, you're able to then go, oh, that's right. I gave him like five, you got to get the laundry, you got to get the garbage, you got to, you got to, this is, by the way, that's three fingers pointing back at me. I'm horrible at that. You can all watch my wife's expression as she's like, ah, yep. You know, oh, she's so generous and kind. Look at that. But, you know, I'm terrible for that. You know, two things. That's when I'm in pursuant mode, right? And I got to present, hey, can I get the garbage done? And maybe in about an hour or two, let's get those dishes out. But you decide. And that's part of those options. Now, that's different than maybe the child raising aspect of things if they're like 12 and under, because that's more oftentimes about issues of safety and developing them in the way that, you know, we want them to grow, you know. And so within that parenting style, that's going to be a little bit different, different topic versus the teenager where there is some expectations, but we're also shifting that for them to be independent or interdependent so this way yes they still need mom and dad's roof over their home and food and stuff but it's teaching those things that they can start learning independence you know so that way they can do that and that means also developing relationship with them not just this is what you do or whatever it's now developing relationship otherwise when you're past that 14 plus age and you're maybe let's say you happen to be more of a let's say authoritarian style of parent, uh, that is where I will politely say out loud, good luck, because that relationship is going to be destroyed faster than you can say, you need to do this. Well, good luck. That's going to be very difficult. Now, if they are running away, though, that's, of course, part of the challenge, of course, and especially with today's well, even this last year with COVID, if if no one was addicted to uh, tablets and TV and YouTube, oh my, I don't know what else is, you know, I mean, this is going to be a year where there's going to be a shift in all of this stimulation and just easy fix kind of just unhealthy coping of just watching, binging on Netflix, watching YouTube cat videos all day, you know, they are in a healthy context, okay, but unhealthily, especially for the processor, that's some of the unhealthy processing I was talking about, rather than intentional processing, or maybe going out for a walk, those kind of things. And uh, I want to just say again, thank you. And God bless you. May you have a wonderful, wonderful night. And as you process all of these things, uh, you know, where do I fit into this? 
How do I deal with my grandkids? I've got so many questions. How do I deal with my grandkids? That's another subject. When they start fighting, do I get involved or do I send them home? Big questions. So Very good questions. <laughs> I, uh, we really appreciate it, and uh, God bless you, and thank you for your participation tonight. Yeah, thank you. Appreciate that. Thank you.